Growing tomatoes that are 18 feet long doesn't just happen because they're weeds. Uh, we have to feed them. Sure. If we want the kind of production we're seeing here, we have to be mindful of tomato plant nutrition, tomato diseases, and insect pests. Hi, Andy. Hello, Sajel. So tell us a little bit about the maintenance of growing the tomatoes this way. Tomatoes, most people's tomatoes in their gardens and on farms, they die of disease. Mm -hmm. That's just kind of the natural process of the life that they live here in the north. Um, a lot of farmers will spray fungicides and that can stave off the disease, but even a farmer that sprays fungicides regularly, their plants will ultimately die of disease. Um, you'll pl find plenty of disease even on, on plants that are treated regularly. All right, then how long do you think the season will go on for you? Hard to say. The right. disease is beginning to pick up a little bit, although these plants are still quite green. Uh, and I'm hoping for mid to late October. Okay. I see a little blossom end rot there. Is that one of the things that's going on here? What, yes. what kind of diseases yes. are that's, you seeing? That's right. There's a, that's an example of blossom end rot. It's nothing to worry about. It's not unusual at all. Blossom end rot is actually a condition in which the plant is not able to get enough calcium okay. into it. Usually, the reason why a plant can't get enough calcium into it is because it's not watered enough and so not enough calcium has actually been solubilized or made available in the soil so the plant can't take it up. Okay. Um, very often for growing in this kind of a system we will supplement through our fertigation system with liquid calcium. So I'm keeping the calcium flowing to these plants. Another reason on these plants in particular why you might get blossom end rot is because the fruit load is so heavy. Mm. So, and when it gets warm in here, these plants just want to grow, grow, grow. Sure, so it becomes intensive. And for they them. keep setting fruit, so they keep demanding more and more calcium. Okay. Um, another nutrient that they very strongly demand is potassium. Sure. Um, and I actually w found that one of the problems I had during the summer in here is there was some fruit ripening disorders. And I figured out that that is mainly because of potassium deficiency. Um, I did two rounds of tissue testing in which I checked the nutrient levels in the leaves uh, just to see what was going on. Right. Every nutrient tested for was perfect, spot on, except for potassium, right. both times. Okay. And I should also mention, we amended the soil with uh, some compost, which is locally produced in, in this area. Um, and we also used a uh, pelletized chicken manure fertilizer. Okay, so uh, you had just mentioned a couple minutes ago fertigation. Uh, is, that, is there an example of that here? Can we take a look? Sure, yeah. So that's okay. this right here? That's this simple five gallon bucket. Okay. And this little apparatus here, which is just nothing more than a siphoning unit. Okay. There are really fancy units you can buy for many hundreds of dollars that um, like dosatrons, um, and those are amazing for sure. when you've got a massive commercial greenhouse operation. Okay. Um, all th this is very simple. Um, when we uh, when we open uh, open this thing up, uh, oh no, sorry. When we close this down, okay. The water is directed up through here, and when it passes through here, it gets squeezed tight by this uh, venturi apparatus, and that creates a suction, and that just draws up whatever fertilizer solution I have in this bucket. Okay. Um, really simple, super low tech. And then that runs through this, uh, into this header pipe. And each, this header pipe has pairs of drip tapes for each row. And this runs right into the other house next door. All right, great. And now uh, what's your method of watering? Are you on a set timer or? I don't use a set timer. I like to water by feel. Great. And that means literally by feel. I stick my finger in the ground and I feel. Um, I also take a look at the plants to just get a sense of, are they looking a little wilty? Um, are they, you know, nice and strong? Especially right. if I walk in here early in the morning and if I see little, what are called gutation droplets along the edges of the leaf, uh -huh. I know I'm good. Right, I don't have right. to water. So it gives you a good sense of what's going on with my plants. If yes. it was on a timer, you might be, eh, they're getting watered. So that's kind of a good way to stay in check with your I'm plants. I'm afraid then. of timing, having a regular timer water because you can be asleep at the wheel with that. Sure, you sure. You just, it's a false sense of being reassured that, uh, oh, the plants are getting watered. I don't have to worry about it. Okay. 
All right, so uh, what are you feeding these plants? Uh, I'm using pretty much all organic amendments. Uh, probably the, the two primary um, sources of nutrients are fish emulsion, which has uh, immediately available nitrogen in it okay. at a low percentage, but it is immediately available. Okay. Um, and it has a, an equivalent amount of phosphorus probably not so immediately available, but available in the long term. Okay. After it's deposited in the soil, it will eventually become available to the plants. Okay. For potassium, mainly what I've been using is uh, seaweed extracts, two different kinds. One is a 1% solution of uh, potassium. Uh, the other one is probably even less but it's very high in a number of plant growth hormones. Um, that, that's a product from Acadian sea plants okay. um, called Stimplex. I think it's done great work for these tomatoes. Sure. I didn't do a controlled study to do with and without, so I can't say for sure. Right. Okay. Um, in this intensive growing situation, how often are you feeding the plants? That also depends on the temperature. Okay. If we are going through a warm spell and these plants are growing very fast, it means they need to be fed more. Right. In which case, I've been pretty much feeding once a week um, all of those uh, those fertilizers. Okay. okay. In addition, I've been feeding liquid calcium, and I've also been using Epsom salt, which is uh, for magnesium and sulfur, but especially for magnesium. Sure. Tomatoes are extremely demanding of magnesium, calcium, and potassium. Yep. Nitrogen, probably most people who garden and farm know you don't want to overdo it with nitrogen on tomatoes sure. because they are weedy. And sure. if you give them too much nitrogen, they just turn into green monsters with lots of green fruit that never ripen. Sure. So it's a delicate balance. Some of this is art. It's mm. watching the plants. It's keeping your head in. Actually, right here, I'm seeing some fecal matter. It looks like from some tomato hornworms. Has oh, that been an issue? Frass. Ah. In, in the entomology <laughs> world, we call that frass. Sure, sure. And this here, yes, this, these black little pebbles are the frass from a tomato hornworm that happens to be sitting right ah, here. Of course he is. Feeding. We do try to hand pick, but what I will end up doing is spraying Bacillus thuringiensis, BT, which sure. is uh, also known as BT. Maybe we'll throw this out the door. All right, sounds good. We do have some bumblebees that come in. Bumblebees are very happy to go around and collect pollen from tomato blossoms. However, I should mention, and that's often an issue when growing tomatoes under cover, pollination can be an issue. We haven't had an issue at all because um, you've probably noticed the uh, plastic has been rattling right. around a yeah, lot. Yeah, yeah. There's a steady breeze out here. Right. As long as there's a steady breeze, these plants are moving. Right. And when these plants get blown about a little bit, they shed their pollen. And so pollination has not been a problem at all. I should mention there's right here, as we're looking at this, I'm seeing powdery mildew. Mm. And this powdery mildew has just picked up in here within the last four weeks or so. Probably first saw a little bit of it second week of August. Didn't think anything of it. Slowly, slowly, it's picked up a little more. Okay. I've been treating it with a, a, a very simple product, which is potassium bicarbonate. Okay, so also uh, approved for organic growing then? Totally approved for, okay. for organic growing. It's kind of like antacid. Antacid is sodium bicarbonate. <laughs> sure. This is potassium carbonate. Okay. Um, simple stuff, and it works. Powdery mildew likes humidity. Sure. Powdery mildew, unlike most other fungal diseases, doesn't need free water. Most of the other fungal diseases really pick up late in the summer, especially on tomatoes, because we start getting the cooler nights. Sure. So the temperature goes below dew point, and then we have a lot of dew, okay. very heavy dew on the leaves. And that's when the spores germinate and really infect the plants. Powdery mildew is different. Doesn't need that. That's why we can see powdery mildew on, on our squashes. Sure. Um, and cucumbers early in the summer right. when we have warm nights. So that product would work on any plant if it had powdery mildew then? That's right, it right. would work on any plant. Okay. And in fact, it is also a pretty good preventative fungicide in general. Okay. This is called Botrytis gray mold. It's really common in greenhouse tomatoes. It's not a horrible disease. It really doesn't take off. I'd say try to keep control of it mainly by clipping out the leaves that are affected by it. Okay. 
It usually only attacks lower leaves. It can attack stems. Sometimes it gets on uh, flower buds. That can be a problem. In fact, I see some right here. A little bit on the outside of this sepal of the flower. Okay. That's probably gray mold. You also may notice that these plants are, these leaves are a bit rolled up. Um, this is called a physiological leaf roll. It's not a disease. It's just a physiological condition. As far as I know from what I've read, mm -hmm. it has to do with the plant reallocating water to the most important parts, which are the fruits and the growing tip. And the result is, is that these leaves go into a curl in order to conserve the water that they have in Okay, them. yeah, I was gonna ask that because you can notice that it's really just happening on the bottom half of That's this plant right. and not so much at the top. Right. So they're just conserving the moisture for the whole plant. Okay. Um, not something to get terribly worried about. All right, so can you tell me a little bit about what's happening with this leaf? Right. Well, this is a really characteristic coloration. Actually, probably one of the easiest nutrient deficiencies to diagnose. Notice that the veins of the leaf are still green, but between the veins, it's yellow. This is magnesium deficiency. Uh, really common on tomatoes. Very easy to correct, again, with Epsom salt or magnesium sulfate. Um, typically, I just run that right through the irrigation system. Okay, simple um, enough, but important. Important. It, some studies say it actually isn't terribly damaging to the yields of the, of the plants. My feeling is keep everybody happy, sure. you'll have less disease. Right. Um, okay. Makes sense. <laughs> but that won't change hornworms' preference. They still love to be here. They are just bullies this season. Yeah. <laughs> Growing healthy and productive tomatoes in high tunnels for six months or more requires ongoing maintenance and attention. These plants just can't keep producing without ongoing applications of fertilizers. And the easiest way to do that is through the drip irrigation system. Plant diseases are less of a problem in high tunnels than they are in the field, but they need to be monitored and controlled, especially if you're hoping to harvest into the fall months.